Okay. And actually, I need to be able to write. So let me grab this as well. Okay, so guys, let me, uh, let me explain to you, as I will always, uh, what we're up to today. The date today is the 29th. Topic for your notes today is lab procedures and percent error. Um, guys, this is, this is a pretty, pretty relaxed day, um, which is probably fitting after the hellfire and brimstone talk that we had on Wednesday, right? I'm assuming that most of the people that are missing right now dropped the class because I scared them. You know, they're actually, they're actually at football and other things. Um, so guys, um, here's what we're going to do today. Last time in class, you know that we got you introduced to the lab. What we actually did though, is we taught you how to not get hurt in lab. What we're going to do today is we're gonna talk about how do you effectively work in lab. There are some skills that you need to have. So guys, this is the way that this is going to work. This is not informational. This is not something you need to memorize. This is not something you need to be able to, to talk about. Or This is something you've got to be able to do. Um, so really what you want to do is you're taking notes is you just want, there, there isn't like a laundry, I'm not going to put bullet points on the board. You just want to write down all the things that you think you may need to remember, for example, to learn, and it, to learn how to uh, light a Bunsen burner, for example. So guys, let me just show you right up front. This is the laundry list of things that you're going to learn to do today. Um, what I find is that it's actually nice to do some of this by video, um, simply because it allows me to embed something in my screencast that people can see so that if you want to reference back to this, you're like, oh, I can just watch this video. So guys, as we go through this, a lot of these videos are actually posted on YouTube. I'm sneaky, so I actually downloaded them and they're embedded in my slides, so we won't be linking to YouTube. I stole their videos, um, but they are available on YouTube as well. So here's what you're gonna learn to do. You are going to learn to light a Bunsen burner, and let me tell you right now, you guys are going to be absolutely horrible at this. Some of you, it's gonna take all day, when do I see you again, Wednesday? We're going to do a lab on Wednesday. Some of you, it's gonna take you half an hour to get your Bunsen burner lit. Guys, I will not help you. I will laugh at you as you're struggling, but I will not help you, okay? So it's actually, it's, I will laugh at you actually, so it's kind of fun. You'll see, you'll, no, you'll start to cry, but it's okay. Um, so, so guys, it's, it's not as easy as it looks. So um, you're going to have to learn. So here's what some of you are going to do. You're gonna grab your lab partner and you're gonna to try to make them the designated Bunsen burner lighter. At the end of this unit, guys, we're gonna take a test and guess what you're gonna to have to do on the test? Light a Bunsen burner. So you both have gotta to learn to do this. Then guys, you are going to learn to tear and operate a balance. Then you are going to learn to read a graduated cylinder. Then you are going to learn to dispense and weigh solids. Then you are going to learn to dispense liquids two different ways. Then you are going to learn how to use a funnel. These are, and a filter. These are all things that you will be doing in class on uh, Wednesday. Um, understand guys that after we're done going over this, when you go into lab on Wednesday, I'm gonna be watching you. And if I see you doing these things wrong, I will be correcting you. It's not gonna be, except for the Bunsen burner part, and then I'll laugh. But if it's other stuff, I'm gonna sort of come alongside you and, and help you learn how to do these things. But I need to see that you're giving it a good faith effort, okay? So Bunsen burner first. So I would write in your notes, light a Bunsen burner. Here is how to light a Bunsen burner. I'm gonna let this young lady uh, show you, and then I will actually just go through and do it with you live, and hopefully after you've seen it twice, you'll have an understanding of how it works. In this video, you're gonna learn how to use a Bunsen burner safely and properly. This is a Bunsen burner. It allows you to heat materials in the lab both quickly and efficiently. 
Because you'll be working with an open flame, it can be dangerous, so I'll start by going over some safety rules. All long hair should be tied back, and you shouldn't wear any loose or bulky clothing. You should never heat inflammable materials on the Bunsen burner. Volatile and inflammable materials like ethers and alcohols can combust in heat, so it's definitely too dangerous for the Bunsen burner. When handling the barrel of the Bunsen burner, it's important to hold it at the bottom. When the flame is lit, it can get very hot any higher up, so doing this regularly will help you to remember to do it. You should never leave your Bunsen burner unattended when it's lit. You should make sure you're aware of where all emergency exits and emergency gas shutoffs are, as well as all safety equipment before you begin using your Bunsen burner. Now that you know all the safety precautions, you can begin to light your Bunsen burner. The first step is to attach the hose to both the Bunsen burner and to the gas line. You don't need to make do sure this, that you guys, attach it to the gas line and not an air or a water They're line. They're always hooked up. You'll now want to turn the barrel clockwise to completely close the air inlet. You might want to say close Do this the until there's resistance. Now turn it back slightly so just a small amount of air is let through. Open You'll also door. want to close the gas needle valve located underneath the Bunsen burner. Shut off Do this by turning it completely counterclockwise. Leave this closed for now and turn on the gas. You will know the gas tap is open when the handle lines up with the tap. You'll now want to turn the gas needle valve clockwise slightly to open it. Open valve. This lets a small amount of gas through. You should be able to hear a faint hissing, which lets you know that the gas is coming out of the burner. The next step is to take your flint and generate sparks over your Bunsen burner. You may want to practice this a few times before you turn the gas on, just like I'm doing. This is the part to do this, you want to push with. up and across. Hold the flint just above the Bunsen burner and generate the sparks. You should now have a flame that's yellow, orange in color. To get a taller flame, turn the gas needle valve clockwise. And likewise, to get a shorter flame, turn it counterclockwise. Once you have your flame at a sufficient height, you'll want to adjust the heat. To make a hotter flame, you'll want to turn the barrel. Do this by holding it at the base. To increase the heat, you'll want to turn the barrel counterclockwise. This should change the color of your flame from the yellow-orange to blue. Be careful when handling the barrel at this point because it can get very hot. Only handle it at the bottom. You'll also want to make sure not to let too much air in because this can blow out your flame. You'll know your flame is ready to use when it's dark blue in color with a darker inner core. You'll want to hold your item just above the inner core to be in the hottest location. Okay, so guys, that's how you light a Bunsen burner. Now, I know that some of that terminology was new to you. So what I want to do is I actually want to talk you through this so that you see how this works and you understand the parts. So guys, with a Bunsen burner, there's a hose that obviously plugs into the tap that's on the, in the, on the tabletop. Now, Bunsen burners actually have three parts. They have, and you'll never take these apart, please don't do this, but it's just good to understand. They have a needle valve. Um, it's actually just a little point, and that needle valve actually screws up into what's called an orifice or a jet that's up inside this base. So when this is screwed all the way up into the orifice, it plugs it and it shuts off the gas. And then as you screw this down, it drops and allows gas to flow. So please don't ever do that. You don't have to take that apart. The other part of this is actually barrel. And the barrel is ventilated through the sides. So you've got the barrel, the base, and the valve. So what's the first thing we do when we light a Bunsen burner? I know they said connect it, but you don't have to worry about connect it. Um, but I'm just going to go through the steps with you. So assuming that this is all connected, what did they tell us to do first? Close the barrel. So what that means is you're going to take the barrel and get used to grabbing it from the base. You grab it from the top and you're going to get burned once it's lit. So you grab this from the base and you screw it shut. What was the next thing that you do? Just open it a teeny bit. What else? What next? Then shut off the valve. Guys, this valve shuts off the gas. So it seems kind of weird. It's like if you're lighting the burner, why would you shut off the valve? What do we do next? 
open this. Now you should leave that. Maybe I'm doing it in a little opposite order. But what you're going to do, guys, is no, it did say you're going to turn on the valve at the at the the desk. And the way this works, guys, is if this is the schnozzle that the hose is on, if the schnozzle and the handle are perpendicular, it's off in either direction. So let me show you from back here. So you can go off, 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 off. That is on when they're parallel. But even though this is on, you'll notice there's no gas flowing. Why not? Shut off at the valve. So guys, it's shut off at the valve, so we have no gas flowing. You can't smell it. There's no gas. So now what do you do? Open the valve. And here's what you're going to do. Guys, don't, don't be afraid of these things. Pick them up. Realize if it's lit, it's going to be hot. But pick the thing up, open up the valve, and can you hear it? Can you hear the gas? Put it next to your ear if you need to. You can smell the gas. There's gas flowing out of that burner now. Now, we, and I, I shut that off because we're going to fill the room with gas. So let's wait for a minute and then I'll turn it back on. You wouldn't normally do that. What you would normally do is you would grab your striker. This is how you light the Bunsen burner. You'll notice that it is not sparking. Guys, you have to learn to use a striker. This is the part that's going to screw you up. So guys, here's the way you use a striker. Ready? You got to get a gun. This is your gun. And it's not just a gun. It has to be a left-handed gun, and it's got to be a gangsta gun. Okay? So when you light a Bunsen burner, you might make note to yourself, left-handed gangsta gun. This is how to do this. What you're going to do... Hi. What you're going to do is you're going to take your left-handed gangster gun and you are going to put the hood of the striker against the barrel of your left-handed gangster gun. A right-handed gangster gun will not work. You need a left-handed gangster gun. And when you get your left-handed gangster gun, you are then going to drop the hammer on this arm of the striker. When you do that and then you squeeze, this thing makes a pant load of sparks. Get the idea? So if you just do this, it doesn't spark. You've got to pinch it between the barrel and the hammer of your gangster gun and then it'll work. Okay, so now we're back here. We've turned on the gas. We know that we have gas flowing because we hear it. We take our gangster gun, we put it over the burner, and we light the Bunsen burner. Guys, here's the thing you got to understand. When that thing lights, you get this big flame and you're like, crap, it's going to burn me. No, it's not. It's not that hot. So guys, don't be afraid of this flickering yellow flame. <laughs> if you stick your hand in it for a couple seconds, you're going to get burned. But when it lights, it's not going to hurt you. You can, you can even leave your hands there a little bit and it's not going to bite you. Okay, this is a very inefficient, low temperature flame. Please don't stick your hand in it for a long period of time, but it's not that hot. So now what we need to do, and she called this adjusting the temperature, adjusting the heat, you've got to make this hot. And guys, the reason that this is not hot is because what you are actually doing is you are burning the natural gas with the oxygen that is up here at the tip of the burner. In order to make this burn more efficiently, you want to mix oxygen in with the gas before it burns. Watch what happens. To do that, you screw open the barrel. As you do, it opens the vents on the side of the barrel. It draws in oxygen, mixes in the barrel, and then as it rises up the barrel, it then gets to the tip and it burns. Guys, this is the flame that you are looking for. Um, does that help you see it at all or can you see it? So what you will notice about this flame is that it's actually a two-part flame. There is an outer jacket to the flame that is purple in color, and then there is an inner part of the flame that is like a turquoise, like an well, turquoise color. That is what you're looking for, a two-part flame with an inner part of the flame that is about an inch tall. Don't put your hand in that. It'll mess you up. This is really hot. 
Then guys, the last thing that you need to learn to do, I forgot to grab a ring stand. When you then use this flame to heat stuff, what you will do is you will actually grab your ring stand, take this, which is called wire gauze, off of the ring, set your Bunsen burner on the ring stand, and then you raise or lower the ring until the ring is even with the hottest inner part of the flame, put the wire gauze back on, and then you're ready to heat stuff. You get the idea? Okay. Now guys, when you're done shutting, when you're done using your Bunsen burner, how do you shut it off? Well guys, if you want to, this isn't necessary, but you can shut, you can blow it out. You can shut off the Bunsen burner by simply just doing this, and that's fine. If you choose to do that, that's okay. But understand guys, that is not officially turned off until you do that. So guys, really, you don't even have to mess around with this valve. What you can do to shut this off is actually just go boom and you're done. Get the idea? So if anything ever catches on fire on your station and you see a flame, it's not fire extinguisher time to put out your Bunsen burner. Just shut off the gas and you're done. So guys, questions about Bunsen burner? You're okay? Okay, so here's what's going to happen on Wednesday. You guys are going to have the gas on and you're going to be struggling for 10 to 15 minutes trying to get this to spark and all the while you are filling the room with natural gas. Just understand it's going to happen. It gets a little stinky. If you're really struggling here, shut this off. Make sure you can make sparks with your gangster gun and then you can come back here and light this thing. Get the idea? A little stinky. All right. So guys, there's Bunsen burner. Questions on that? You're all good? Okay. So let me get this out of the way. Be real careful around these things. They get hot. All right. So what else can I get rid of? My striker. Okay. So guys, that was Bunsen burner. So now let's do this. Yep. There we go. Okay. So guys, the next thing that you need to learn how to do is you need to learn how to operate a balance. When you think of a balance, you're probably thinking about a scale. We'll talk about the difference between scales and balances, but if you've ever weighed something on a scale, um, it's similar to using a balance. We'll talk more about the difference later. So here we go. How do you use a balance? The electronic balances that we have are a wonderful piece of equipment to help. This is actually a lot like what our balances look like. Let's measure masses very quickly and very accurately. However, they're often one of the biggest sources of error in labs, mostly because button. of the misuse of the That'll tear button. The weighing dish. Uh, the tear and button now, is located right here on these particular balances. And uh, what it does, it basically subtracts whatever's on the balance. Right now you can see that the balance reads zero. So guys, that might have been hard to hear. You may want to include this in your notes. The thing that they were talking about that got talked over the top of is a thing called the tear button. Tear, T-A-R-E, is essentially the re-zero button. What it is actually doing is it is subtracting out the weight of whatever is on the balance. So if there's nothing on the balance and you hit tear, it's re-zeroing the balance. But if you put a beaker on the balance and hit tear, what it's doing is it's subtracting out the mass of the beaker and it's displaying zero. It actually knows the mass of the beaker and it's subtracting it out to return it to zero. Remember that thing we talked about with the beaker and the sugar, that trick? It's actually doing the math for you. So the tear button you can think of as the re-zero button. But understand what it's really doing is subtracting out the mass of whatever's on the balance. Oh boy. Here we go. Labs, mostly because button. of the misuse of the That'll tear button. the weighing dish. Uh, the tear button is located right here on these particular balances. 
And uh, what it does, it basically subtracts whatever's on the balance. Right now you can see that the balance reads zero. If I put an object on the balance, such as this beaker, uh, we can see that the mass has changed. If I hit the tear button, that subtracts it. And now you see the mass still reads zero, even though there's something on the balance. Now, if I want to know the mass of the beaker, um, I want to make sure that it says zero before I put the beaker on. So I would hit tear. Now it says zero. Now I'll put the beaker on, and I'll have the mass of the beaker. If I then were to put an object in it, as is, now I have the mass of the beaker and the substance that is in the beaker. I have so how do you then find the mass of the thing in the beaker? You subtract. Good. Okay. Both. However, many times in lab, we're not interested in the mass of the beaker or the mass of the weighing dish. We're interested just of the mass of the chemical that we're putting in it. So, for example, if I have some sugar, and I want to know what mass of sugar that I'm using, I'll obviously need to put something down. I never will put a chemical directly on the pan, so I'll need either a beaker. Guys, please make sure you catch that. Never put chemicals directly on the balances. Mass of the beaker or the mass of the weighing dish. We're interested just of the mass of the chemical that we're putting in it. So, for example, if I have some sugar, and I want to know what mass of sugar that I'm using, I'll obviously need to put something down. I never will put a chemical directly on the pan, so I'll need either a beaker or a weighing dish, such as this one. I'll put that down. Now, right now, it's showing me the mass of the weighing dish, 1.47 grams. And guys, we'll be using weighing dishes all year. They're called weighing boats. If I add the sugar to it, that'll be the mass of the sugar and the weighing dish. But I don't want the weighing dish, so I can hit the tear button. That'll subtract the weighing dish. And now, I can pour the sugar in. And the mass that it's giving me now, 5.69 grams, is simply the mass of the sugar. So the big thing to remember when you're using the balance is... Okay, guys, listen close here. You want the balance to say zero before you put whatever you're measuring. Okay, so if I want to measure the beaker, I want to hit zero first. Now I put the beaker on. Now that's the mass of the beaker. If I pour the sugar in that, now since I didn't hit zero now, that will be the mass of both the beaker and the sugar. So you just have to be really careful of when you push that tear button so that you know exactly what this number you're seeing down here is measuring. And that's one of the biggest sources of error uh, that we have in our labs. Does that make sense? Is that okay? And you'll have time to practice with that when we get to lab on Wednesday. And if you have questions, let me know. You will actually have your own balances at your tables um, so you'll have plenty of opportunity to get access to these. Is that okay? Okay, no questions there? All right, so then guys, the next thing that we need to do is we need to talk about how to read a graduated cylinder. Um, and what you need to do, gang, is you need to write down those two terms in your notes that are given there with the graduated cylinder. The terms are meniscus and parallax. Go ahead and write them down and then we'll talk about them. So the meniscus is the concave up surface. Oh, that should be on, not of. On a liquid in a cylinder. So guys, the meniscus is the concave up. And if you don't know what concave up means, it means it's like cupped up or dished up. It's the concave up surface on a liquid in a cylinder. And then parallax is an error in measurement that is caused by misalignment. Now guys, let me explain to you what these two mean so that when you watch the video, you'll be able to look out for them. Um, some of you may know, ooh, that's not a good color. Some of you may know this. Um, when you put water in a cylinder, the surface of the water is not flat. Does anyone know why? 
It is. It's actually surface tension. The water molecules are attracted to each other, but they're also attracted to the glass. And they are more tightly attracted to the glass um, through something that is sort of like surface tension. And so, guys, what happens is this. You will actually get the water drawn up the sides of the cylinder. That dip that it creates is called the meniscus. Now, here's the problem. If you're trying to find, comparing to a scale, if you're trying to find the volume of that water, where are you going to read from? It's actually not. It's the bottom. You might include that in your notes. You always measure from the bottom of the meniscus. So if we were trying to measure this volume, if this was like two, three, four, five, six, that would be where we would measure from. We would measure from the bottom. And then let's check this to see if you remember. Guys, if this measures in whole milliliters, what volume would we write down? 5.3, 5.4. Remember, we always estimate one decimal place past the accuracy of the device. You guys okay on that? Okay, here's the other thing you need to be thinking about when you are reading volumes in a graduated cylinder. So we understand that there's a meniscus that we're going to have to deal with. But guys, imagine if I was trying to read the volume of this water like this. See the problem? What's wrong? I'm reading at an angle. I have no idea where that meniscus is sitting because I'm reading from up here. So when you make measurements like this, what have you got to do? Cut down on the angle by either drop, if this is like on a tabletop, you may have to drop your butt or pick the thing up. That's what parallax is. Oh, in where? Oh, sorry. So, guys, the idea here is that you've got to get lined up with the scale. You can't be above or below because that causes parallax, which is an error in measurement caused by misalignment. You guys okay? Okay. So, how do you read a graduated cylinder? Coming at you. Uh-oh. Oh, now I'm drawing dots. Okay. How to read a graduated cylinder. We've got a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder here. And the first step we need to do is determine where our marks lie. We have a numbered mark of eight. Now guys, this is important. We have graduated cylinders that measure by fives, by ones. We even have graduated cylinders that measure by point twos. I hate them. If you have one that measures by point twos, I would be more than happy to trade you for one because measuring by point twos is a pain in the butt. But this is important. You got to determine the scale. Eight here, and we have a numbered mark of nine. We have unnumbered marks between eight and nine, valued at point one. In order to go from eight to nine, we would go 8.1, 8.2, etc., up to nine. So we know for certain that this liquid has a volume somewhere between 8.5 and 8.6. Can you see the meniscus? She actually is measuring from the bottom of it. The last digit we record is our estimated digit or uncertain digit. So guys, if this graduated cylinder measures in tenths, what will the measurement look like that we take? Hundreds. Watch, she does a nice job of explaining this. How far between 8.5 and 8.6 does this measurement lie? To determine that, you want to get your eye at the level of the meniscus, which is the bottom of the curved surface. And you need, as the scientist, as the observer, you need to determine how far between 8.5 and 8.6 the bottom of the meniscus lies. I'm going to estimate it to be 8.56. You get the idea? Always one place past the accuracy of the device. Watch out for, for the bottom of the meniscus. Cut down on parallax by lining yourself up. You okay? 
Okay, so guys, we have now done one, two, and three. Now what you need to do is you need to learn how to dispense and weigh a solid. That says weight. Um, you need to learn how to dispense and weigh a solid. And so guys, in order to do this, the, it gets a little frustrating. I will tell you this right now. No, I'll tell you at the end. It'll be better to watch the video first. What you're going to find, guys, is it's very frustrating to get accurate amounts of solids. This is really good advice on how to do this. When you're trying to measure out a desired mass of a chemical, it's important that you don't put too much of the chemical. Let's say I was measuring two grams of sugar. Well, I would first use a beaker or a weighing dish, put that on. Now I don't want the mass of that. So what's he gonna do? Hit the tear button. Poop. Take two. Put too much of the chemical. Let's say I was measuring two grams of sugar. Well, I would first use a beaker or a weighing dish, put that on. Now I don't want the mass of that dish, so I'll hit the tear button. So it says zero. And now I want to put two grams of sugar in. Now it's very important that I don't go over because remember, as soon as that chemical hits the co another container, I consider it contaminated. So if I put more than two grams in, I can't just scoop it out and put it back in this bottle. We want to... Okay, let's pause. Why not? Did you hear what he said? Guys, if I ever see you do this, I will find you and kick you out of lab. Do not ever, here's the rule. It's, I know you're like, oh crap, another rule. Okay, guys, there's really two rules. Keep your goggles on and don't put stuff back in bottles. Here's the rule. Once the chemical comes out of the stock bottle, it is assumed to be contaminated. So the minute you touch that with your chemical scoop, your spoon, it's now contaminated. So if you get, well, that's not completely true. Sometimes we'll have sterile spoons, but the minute it touches your weighing device, it's considered to be contaminated. So you can scoop it out with your spoon, but if you dispense too much, you never put it back. The stuff that's in your spoon you can put back, but you never put the stuff back that's in the beaker or the weighing dish. So that's why he's saying to be careful. The rule is never put stuff back into a stock bottle. So how do you avoid it? Check it out. These bottles pure. So what we want to try to do is to ease up to that two grams without going over. So I use my spatula to put a certain amount in. Now, I might not know how much of this looks like two grams. So if I just dump this whole thing in, I might go over. Uh, and if I just dump it this way, I don't have very good control uh, of how well it flows into the dish. And it might go nothing, nothing, and then f all at once. And so what I use is what I call the tap method uh, to allow this. Notice if I just slowly tap on this spatula, notice that it just slowly puts an even amount in. Now if I want two grams, I can watch the balance there and get an idea that I'm not very close yet. And so I'm going to need about another one of those scoopfuls. And notice I'll, again, just lightly tap on this, making sure all of the sugar, in this case, goes in the pan. And I can just slowly watch it ease up to my two grams. I have very good control. I can just get a couple grains at a time in this way. And we'll just slowly ease up to two grams. Now guys, this is the idea. Once you got to two grams, let's talk about what you can do with this. So what is he going to end up doing with this sugar that's in the spoon, the stuff that's left? That can go back. Why, do, why is it that it's okay to put that back? Well, we've already stuck this spatula into the jar. So if the spatula is contaminated, we've all, are you okay? If the spatula is contaminated, we've already contaminated the sample. So here's what will happen. When I set out stock bottles for you, you will not use your own spatula. I will set out a sterile spatula that can only be used with that chemical. So anything that's on the spatula is okay to put back, because if it wasn't, we contaminated it anyway with putting the spatula in the bottle. Now what if they put too much stuff in here? Can that go back in the bottle? 
No. So here's the question, because it's going to happen to you. What happens if you get too much stuff in your weighing boat? Throw it away. Okay, so if you get too much stuff, what you can do is you can scoop a little bit of it out with your spatula and literally throw it in the trash. Then put it back on the balance, get a little bit more out of the stock bottle and try to sneak up on it again. Do you get the idea? So anything on the spatula is okay to put back, but if it's in the weighing thing, never put it back. Go ahead, Jay. No, that's a good point. If you can make that happen, that's actually a better way to do it, is scoop it out of the boat so you're now under two grams, tap in what you need, but now the stuff in the spoon can't go back, right? Here's the thing. If you were in a college lab, I would have had to have said no, and think about why. So what do you know about the stuff in the boat? Contaminated, right? So if you put that spoon back in there, you've now contaminated your spoon. That was college training just coming out of my mouth. So the idea is technically what you should do is throw this away and start with new so you're not sticking the spoon into the boat. You're okay if you do. Um, we're not that caught up about it, but never pour out of the boat into the stock bottle. Is that okay? Were you going to say? Yeah, well, if you touch like the spoon, which you yeah. repeat, yeah. and then make the same. But understand, we're not talking about biologically contaminated. We're talking about chemically contaminated. It's not like you're, it's not like a needle you don't want to stick yourself with. It's that we just don't want other chemicals on there. So you guys okay with that? Okay, so let's, uh, I think we're done with weighing. I'm curious to see, I don't remember what he does. Let's see how this finishes. Is it a time in this way? And we'll just slowly ease up to two grams. There you go. Oh, he never showed us. All right. So guys, the next thing that we need to do is we need to talk about dispensing liquids. And I don't like the videos that I found for these. So this I'm just going to do with you live in front of you. Um, you may want to write this down in your notes. When we talk about dispensing liquids, you need to understand there's a difference between pouring and transferring. So you may want to write pouring and then skip a couple lines and then write transferring because those are different. Are we okay? Maybe I'll just leave the projector on. I think I'll, I, I can move over to the left and I won't get blinded. Okay, so here's the idea, guys. Let me set this scenario for you. Um, you're in lab on Wednesday. Uh, actually, you won't be doing this in lab on Wednesday, but you're in lab and you need to get 10 milliliters of whatever is in this bottle, okay? So here's the problem, and I know you have no experience, so let me sort of paint the picture for you. Guys, what we will do in lab is we will always put all of the chemicals on that table up front where we had the fire extinguisher and stuff last time. It'll always, everything will be up front, but some labs, there will be... 30 bottles up here on the front table, sometimes more. So here's the problem. We're doing a lab and there's all these bottles sitting up here at the front of the table and people are coming up here and they're, hey, yo, and I'm going to get some of this and I'm going to get some of that and I need some of this and I'm going to get some of that. See the problem? What's going to happen when you, not me, because I never clean up the lab after you, that's your job. What's going to happen at the end of the day when you guys go to clean up the lab? You don't know what lids go with what bottles. And then you screw the wrong lids on the wrong bottles and you contaminate the samples for everybody for the rest of the lab. So guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to pour from a bottle. I know it seems silly, but this is how you do it. Guys, first thing that you always do is read the label. Is this what I need? Yes, it is. This is just water, by the way. Then here's what you will do. You'll set the bottle down and you will screw the lid off the bottle. Then what you want to do is you want to take the lid and you want to shove it in the palm of your dominant hand. I'm a lefty. 
So you're going to take the lid and you're going to shove it in the palm of your dominant hand and then you are going to palm the lid between your hand and the bottle. You will never sit a lid down on the table. I, there will never be a lid on the table. So you palm the lid between the bottle and your hand and then you dispense, again this is water, but you dispense whatever you need. Now guys, what if you get too much? Uh-uh, down the drain or in the waste bucket, depending on what it is. You get what you need, you put that down, you take the lid, you put it immediately back on the bottle, and then it's okay to put back. So the thing you've got to remember is always palm your lids. Okay? You all right on that? Okay. Now, guys, there's another way that we can dispense liquids. Pouring works great if we need large volumes. But what if we need small volumes? Well, guys, what we use is this. This is what is called a graduated pipette. A pipette is simply a dropper. Graduated means that there's little lines on the schnozzle of the pipette that are measured in milliliters. So guys, this top line is one milliliter. So what do we do if we need one milliliter of this solution? Here's what you do. Put the bottle down, palm the lid, grab the bottle. Then what you're going to do is you're going to squeeze the bulb of the pipette and you're going to go and you're going to fill it up. You don't have to take it out of the bottle, but I will to show you. I filled up about a third of the bulb of the pipette. Then what you do is you allow this to drip into the bottle. Is that okay or are we contaminating? It's okay because the dropper will only be used in this bottle. You'll see they'll actually be attached together. The dropper will only be used in this bottle. If it wasn't okay, we shouldn't have stuffed it in there in the first place. So what you do then is you will drip this down until the meniscus is sitting right on the top of that one milliliter line. Once it's there, let go. And what it has done is it has drawn that one milliliter of solution up into the bulb. Then you can take this and get wherever you want it and you can dispense that one milliliter of solution. Get the idea? So that's the difference between pouring and transferring. Pouring, you palm the bottle and pour. Transferring involves a transfer pipette or a, a graduated pipette, and you fill, overfill it, drip it down to whatever volume you need, then let it suck in, and then dispense it where you need it. Get the idea? You okay? Okay. All right, so that's that. Then, guys, the last thing we need to talk about, we're done with videos now. We need to talk about how to use a funnel and a filter. Guys, you are going to be uh, needing to filter in lab on Wednesday. Here's how you do it. So this is the funnel that you have in your drawer, and this is a piece of filter paper. What you're going to do, guys, is you're going to put the filter paper in the funnel, and you're going to pour a mixture through it, and you're going to separate it using the filter. Now, guys, here's how you do this. This is going to feel like making snowflakes in kindergarten. You're going to fold this in half once, then you're going to fold it in half twice so that you have a cone shape. Now, once that you've done that, here's what you're going to do. See these two edges over here, the ones that are folded flat? You are going to tear one of them off. See how much I tore off? You're going to tear. You guys are going to remember this, right, on Wednesday? No, you should be writing this down. You're going to fold twice, then tear a corner. You're going to fold this twice and then you're going to tear a corner. Then guys, what you're going to do is this. Um, let me make this really stand out. If you then look at the filter paper from the top, you will notice that there are four pleats. But you will notice that two of the pleats are torn and two of the pleats are not. What you're going to do is you're going to take your finger and you are going to shove them between the two pleats that are not torn. You're going to shove them in here. Okay? Then you'll notice that when you do that, it makes a funnel shape. And this funnel shape perfectly fits your funnel and now you have a filter that you can use to separate substances. So guys, why do we tear the corner? 
Actually, it's not. The reason that you tear the corner is because if you didn't, there would be like a crease there that creates a bump, and that bump is a place where the filter can leak. So when you tear that corner, it actually causes this to sit more flush inside your filter, and it's less likely to leak. This is where this gets frustrating. Guys, watch what happens when I let go. So what are we going to do to keep that from moving around? <laughs> Get it wet. All you got to do is turn on some water, put a little water in there, and then it sticks and you're good to go. Okay. Now guys, one thing, another thing you should be thinking about when you're filtering, um, it looks like this. You've got your filter, you've got the paper. Oh, let me do that differently. You've got the paper inside the filter. Guys, you've got to be careful that you do not fill the funnel up over the level of the paper. Because if you overfill the funnel above the level of the paper, your solid will go around behind the filter paper and it won't be filtered. So never fill a funnel up above the level of the paper. All right. So guys, where are we at here? What do we need to talk about? Go ahead. Uh, fold it twice, tear the corner, stick your finger between the two untorn pleats, turn it into like a funnel shape, and then get it wet. Is that okay? So guys, you now have at least an awareness of all the things that you've got to be able to do in lab on Wednesday. Any questions about any of that? Yeah, please. Do you know where uh, transfer is going to happen? Mm-hmm. You bet. So, um, oh, there it is. So it's really pouring. You're going to palm the lid. Then what you're going to do is you're going to squeeze the bulb, fill it up. Just, oh, poop. Don't let go of it, though. Okay. So fill it up. And then what you're going to do is you're going to allow it to drip down. Can you see it dripping? You're going to let it drip down until the meniscus, just like in a graduated cylinder, until the meniscus rests on that line, which is one milliliter, if that's how much you want. And then once it's resting on that line, let go. That slurps that one milliliter up into the bulb. Now you have it trapped, and then you can put it wherever you want it. Okay? Yeah, so here, let me show you up close. So fill it down to a milliliter, and then when you let go, it draws it all up into the bulb. And that's your milliliter, and then you can put it wherever you want. You guys okay? What else do you want to talk about? You good on this? Good? Okay. So guys, what we need to do now then is you now understand how to do the things you're going to be doing in lab. There's a couple other things I need to talk with you about. It's going to take about five minutes and then you will have actually a good amount of time to get your homework done. And don't let me forget, I'm going to make your homework assignment shorter. Let's take the long weekend off. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So good on you that you even picked up on that. The reason is this. And it even it, look when we get into lab on the side of the Erlen. Let's. So what Jay said is, why don't we measure volumes in an Erlenmeyer flask or a beaker? We always use graduated cylinders. Why? The reason is because gradu or beakers and Erlenmeyer flasks are understood to be inaccurate. So then the question becomes, why do they put a stupid scale on the side of them anyway if it's no good? And the answer is because you want to have a ballpark idea of how much you have in here, but it even tells you right on the side, plus or minus 5%. These are not meant to be accurate. When they cast the glass, there's imperfections in the glass, and they don't account for them. In a graduated cylinder, these are more carefully cast, and they're, they're actually accurate to about 0.1%. So, um, and we have other glassware that's accurate out to like three decimal places. So these are, these are rough ideas, but they're never perfect. Okay. You guys okay on all of this? Okay. So guys, what we need to do now then, and you're going to want to shift into note taking mode. Guys, we now need to talk about a couple mathematical things that you need to know in order to analyze your data in lab. Okay. So guys, you've communicated to me, you all understand significant digits, right? Okay, now we need to talk about how significant digits 
play into doing math. You ready? Here's what you need to know. Uh oh, come here. Um, oops. I'm drawing dots. Try again. Guys, here is what you need to know. Oh, look. Oh, I clicked on a button. Sorry. There we go. Burner. Okay. In this the electronic video, balances that we have are a wonderful piece of equipment to help ah. us measure masses very quickly oh, and very accurately. And accurately. All right. So, guys, here's, here's what you need to know. First of all, significant digits when you are adding or subtracting. So when you do an addition or a subtraction, how many significant digits go in your answer? The answer is, there's no rule. There is not a significant digit rule for addition or subtraction. But there's a different rule, and you need to know this. Here's the answer. When you add or subtract, you can serve decimal places and not significant digits. And I'll show you, you're like, what? I'll show you. It'll make sense. You ready? Here's a number. 125.50 grams. Write it down. How many significant digits are in that number? Five. Why is that zero significant? Final zero after the decimal. You guys are like significant digit experts. OK, so five significant digits in that number. Let's now subtract this number. How many significant digits in 2.3? Two. Now. Guys, you may know, and if you don't know, let me just tell you. You may know the rule for significant digits when you're multiplying or dividing. Does anybody know it? What is it? The fewest. So you look at all the numbers that you're multiplying or dividing. Whichever one has the fewest significant digits, that's how many goes in your answer. But watch this. Addition and subtraction is different. How many significant digits here? Five, how many there? Two. So if the rule was the same for addition and subtraction, how many significant digits would go in our answer? Two, because that's the fewest. But guys, watch this. This is actually the answer. It's not two, and it's not five. It's four. Why is this answer correct? It has nothing to do with significant digits. What is it, Nick? Yes. Here's the deal. Guys, when you're adding and subtracting, you don't care about significant digits. You care about decimal places. There's two decimal places here. There's one decimal place there. So you get one decimal place in your answer. So guys, the big, would it, do you guys, would it be helpful to write down the significant digit rule for multiplication and division? Or do you all know it? I assumed you knew it and now I'm realizing that's not okay. Should I, should I put it down? Let me put it down for those that aren't quite sure. So I think the best thing to do would to do this, and I'll just move all of this down, and then I'll push this up. So significant. Do you guys struggle typing in public? This is seriously like one of those things. I mean, some people don't like to like sing or I, I hate typing in public. Significant digits during multiplication and division. Um, do you guys have a way that you understand this that would be a good way for me to write this? So, um, I know. So, how would I say this? Um, you get as many significant, do you guys like calling them oh, sig, 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 nif, I can't, <laughs> digits in your answer as the 
least known, the smallest number in the calculation. How about that? Would it be helpful to see an example? Okay, let's try this. What if we do this, and then we'll copy this and paste it, and then let's change this to multiplication, and then let's grab a calculator, and then that would be 12. And if we multiply those, we get 1. Significant digits do we get? You know, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually leave it like, like this, this, and then and then we'll go bum 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 bum. And so guys, so guys, the idea. the idea. How many how many significant do we have here? Up here? Five. How many do we have there? Up there? Two. Two. So we only so we only get significant digits. Our answer answer. So what is what is rounded round to significant digits? Two nine nine. So that so would that actually, would actually be, the be the correct answer, answer but I think it would be healthy to show the wrong one, one, one just, just so people see it. See it. Yeah. So this so is this multiplication, multiplication and division, and that would be subtraction and addition. You okay? You okay. You're good? You're good. Okay. So there you go. There you go. Guys, one last one thing last to show you, and then we're done, and then you're probably, probably still going to get your homework done. Last thing we need to talk about is this. Guys, when you do labs, many times you will be graded on how well you did in lab. And how do we know how well you did in lab? Well, guys, the answer is this. Many times we know how much stuff you should have produced. And you will then calculate how much stuff you did produce. And then by figuring out how much stuff you lost, that will then impact your grade. And so I'll say something like, if you lost more than 10% of your product, you're going to get a grade deduction. So the question is, how do we calculate that? How do we know how much of your product you lost? Well, guys, this is what is called a percent error calculation. So you need to know the percent error equation. It looks like this. Just write it down. So percent error is equal to experimental minus accepted divided by accepted times 100. And guys, what did the little straight up and down lines mean in the numerator? Absolute value, which means what? Never negative. Yeah, positive. So if your subtraction generates a negative number, just make it positive. OK. Now, guys, the question is, what do these things mean? Well, the experimental value is the value that you measure or calculate. The accepted value is the correct value. You ready for this? This is a measure of accuracy, how close you are to correct. So here's how you do the calculation. How much did I get? minus how much I should have got, divided by how much I should have got, times 100, and that gives us the percent error. Y'all caught up? You're good? So guys, I'd like to show you an example so that you have something to go off of. So if you'd like a moment to write this down, you'll be solving problems like this. It says a chemist reacts some sodium and some chlorine together in a closed Pyrex container. It doesn't matter. They're doing chemistry. Then it says this. The chemist expects to produce 17.2 grams of product. The product is table salt, by the way, NaCl. So you think you're going to get 17.2 grams. But when the lab is all done, you get 13.85 grams. You lost more than three grams of product. What is your percent error? Do you understand the question? So if you'd like a moment to write it down, do that. And then, guys, we're going to have a little chit-chat.
tell you what, let's have the chit chat while you're writing. Guys, please never make the mistake of asking me the following question. Do we need to write down our equations? I will never apologize to you for demanding that you write down equations. So guys, when you do the homework, you are going to solve three of these. You will write down this equation all three times. What's that? I call them equations. If you call them formulas, that's fine. Guys, whatever you think that is, you always write down equations before solving problems. If you don't, you will probably cheat on the homework and give yourself credit for it when you're grading the homework. When I grade your test, I'm going to nail you. Guys, always write down your equations. And you know me well enough by now, now right? That, guys, I'm not doing this to be like weird or overbearing. It's critical you do this because these things get hard. Get in the habit of writing down equations. Go ahead. Yes, both. So you always write down this first, and then we're going to plug in numbers. So guys, are you all caught up with me? Yeah. 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 Yeah, wait until you do the lab on Wednesday. You're going to lose product like crazy. So where did it go? You're actually talking about a process called error analysis. And we will talk about how to do that when we write up the labs. Because one of the things that you'll do, you're like, how did he lose four grams of stuff? It happens all the time. And so what we'll actually do is we'll talk about figuring out what went wrong. Yeah, it's a great question. So guys, let's set this up. So if you're all caught up with me, we now need to plug in numbers. So here we have percent error. Now, what is our experimental value? Well, what does experimental mean? The amount that you actually got. So how much did they actually get? 13.85 grams. You'll notice that my number has units. You'll notice that I included the absolute value bars. Now, what is the accepted value? Well, that's the amount they thought they would get. And how much did they thought they would get? 17.20 grams. And this same number goes in the denominator, 17.2 grams. Now we have the problem set up. Now we need to solve it. Now, guys, watch. How, the first thing we're going to do is this subtraction. How do we know what our answer is going to look like? How many decimal places here? Two. How many decimal places here? Two. So how many will be in our subtraction? Two. And so we subtract, and we get 3.35 grams. Why is it not negative 3.35 grams? Because it's absolute value. Now, guys, watch this. Now we move the 17.20 down to the denominator. Now we need to think again. Now we are dividing. How many significant digits here? How many significant digits here? Three. How many here? Four. So how many do we get in our answer? The fewest three. Did you catch that? Guys, for the subtraction, we were concerned about decimal places. For the division, we are concerned about significant digits. So three significant digits here, four there. We get three in our answer. And this guy lost 19.5% of his product. If you were trying to get a job as a chemical engineer, you'd get fired. Yeah. 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 Um, that's a good question. We talk more about this later, so I'm trying to figure out what answer I could give you. There's actually rules for that. We haven't talked about them yet. So I'm trying to figure out what answer would do the least damage. Um, let's say this. If it's all multiplication and division, wait until the end. Okay. If there's any addition or subtraction in there, do those at that moment. 
that works. That wasn't bad for being on the fly. That'll work. So you guys all okay here? So guys, if you have something on your paper that doesn't look like this, you're not okay. Anywhere you cut corners, whether it's writing down units or, or writing the equation, this is what this has to look like. Okay? Okay, so let's talk about the homework. Guys, here's what we're going to do. On the first page, what if we just do 1, 3, and 5? I think if you can do three of these, you can do seven of them. Um, no, you know what? Let's not do one. Okay, I'm, guys, I'm, I'm looking at the units that are on these, and I don't know that I want... Okay, actually, here's what we'll do. Sorry, don't, don't kill me. Um, let's do... Ah, uh, you'll be fine. Let's do one, three, and five. And then, guys, on the back, answer all of these. We will grade these on Wednesday, and you're going to lab. If you don't have your goggles here yet, they'd better be here Wednesday or you're not joining us. Yeah. Okay. So, guys, you all good? What do you say you get these done? You'll get really close if you get on this. And, guys, another thing you need to understand, on Fridays... Friday afternoons, I have one goal after fourth period. Beat Mr. Mauer to my truck. And you have no idea how stinking fast he is for being short and kind of crazy. <laughs> Guys, we, like, we've got to be out that door before the bell's done ringing or he'll beat me. And that's not okay. So we are gone, gone at two, like, 14.9. Yeah? All right. One time, Mr. Mauer and I actually raced to get our entire classes out of the door, and the girl in my class got trampled. She actually got injured. Like, everyone was flying over desks to get out the door, and this girl tripped, and somebody stepped on her. So, um, please, please don't be that girl. What did you want to look at?